Hey guys, welcome to the Disruptors, the podcast with the folks literally disrupt in the way we think about, well, everything. Today, we've got somebody with an epic name doing awesome work. We've got Prosantha Shakbarati, Shakbarati on the program. I'm doing the best I can right now. I'm terrified by the tiger in the background, so I get I get a little bit of credibility. How's that? How's it going, Prosantha? Everything's going quite well. Thank you. Everything is going well. So you told me you have an incredibly interesting journey in terms of how you've gotten here. So I wanted to start there because how you got here, I think, determines who you are. Sure. So, uh, well, I should say where here is, is uh, Baton Rouge, Louisiana, a place I, I never really knew anything about. And suddenly it's been 10 years since I've been here. But I, I grew up in New York City. I was actually born in Montreal, but didn't spend much time there uh, when I I had my first birthday actually in India. I learned to walk and talk there. So my parents moved me about early on. And then uh, I stayed in New York for a long time, went back to Montreal to go to university at McGill and uh, then to Ann Arbor for grad school. Actually, I also spent some time in New York between there and uh, did a postdoc at the American Museum of Natural History in New York. And then got this job here, and and here I am ten years later, very happy, and and this lovely town that I wish more people knew about more about, Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Yeah, I've heard uh, I've heard some pretty awesome things. So you you've definitely bounced around a bit, but somewhere in that story, your love of animals must have come in. What's the deal? Yeah, I, well, growing up in New York, I didn't see much wildlife, and. Um, I kind of loved animals, and I, I can't explain why. I think uh, some people are born naturalists, whether no matter where they're from. And I uh, went to the Bronx Zoo, and I'd go to the American Museum of Natural History. And I remember looking up at the dinosaurs and asking my dad, you know, what's the people that study that stuff? And uh, he told me about zoology for the first time, and I never really wanted to be anything else since then. So... I got to my early beginnings at probably five years old, five, six years old, and I stuck with it. So I was pretty lucky. So you really had two things. You had the parents supporting you, and then you had the public the public infrastructure. In New York, it's it's quite good, is my understanding, for getting at least involved in, in nature, having awesome, awesome history museums, awesome zoos. Do you think that played a role? It did. Um, I think um, having... A forest or you know more natural spaces would be great um, but those museums and zoos are, are just fantastic I, I, I was really privileged to grow up in in the US in you know its largest city I know that there are plenty of people with more talent than me growing up with less privilege uh, with you know the lacking those institutions so I'm, I'm quite lucky Why'd you go back to Canada for college? Was that just because the U.S. is stupidly expensive? <laughs> I actually, you know, I, I probably would have ended up going to Queens College in Queens, but McGill had a zoology program, and I really wanted to study zoology, and I, I went uh, partly because of that, partly because I, I was really enamored with McGill uh, during a couple of visits to Montreal. It just looked like a castle to me, like a beautiful, and it still does. I, I, I love the the copper green tops of the buildings. And of course, I ended up going to the McDonald campus for three of the four years, which is where the zoology program is based. And that's in a, a 700 acre forested area. That's just lovely. It's, I had a wonderful undergraduate experience. What does one do in a zoology degree? And then we'll get a little bit more into what you've done since. Yeah, I wish there were more of them. They're kind of fading away as people tend to move biology towards the um, molecular or towards the medical fields, even for introbiology, um, instead of the organismal. But zoology is basically organismal biology. Um, so I, I took a lot of classes about natural history. We went out a lot uh, to look at and study birds. We did lots of hands-on classes. Um, I also learned about fungi and plants and all kinds of stuff. And, and so you, you get that, you know, standard physics, chemistry, uh, ca um, calculus stuff, but you also get a whole bunch of really fun organismal classes. And, and I wish more people could have that opportunity. 
should that be something that's in high school? Should we be cutting out? I mean, by your by your senior year, your junior year, what's the point of another English class? What classes would you change? How would you change our education system? I loved my English class in high school. I almost went into an English major, and if I hadn't gotten into McGill, I I probably would have gone to Queens to study lit or something. But I remember you dodged the bullet there, bud. I did. I I'm not sure why I, why I had this dichotomy. Probably because I loved my English class so much in high school. Um. But I, I ended up taking, I walked into a, a poetry class at McGill and, and found it was, just wasn't for me anymore. And so um, I loved uh, that early on, you know, reading fiction and, and writing fiction in that high school class. So I wouldn't eliminate it, but I would broaden the horizons. I, I wish more high schools had the opportunity to have kids go, uh, if not study abroad, study, you know, their natural areas around where they live. I actually put in a grant for people to start bringing high school kids out to places where animals and plants have been discovered in the U.S., which is in every state. You know, there's there's natural areas where animals and plants were discovered in that state and fungi too, among other things. So bringing kids out the, to those places and say, look, someone came here in 1812 and discovered, you know, this kind of plant here so let's look and see if it's still there or what's changed about our country in that time and of course you could do that in any country but living in the u.s and focusing here do you think that digital age has made it w significant obviously it's made it worse do you think it's made it significantly worse in terms of how the public and how kids view nature um i don't know if it's worse i i think in part it can be because people we you know we live in the space between our phones and our faces and we forget to look up sometimes and look around. But some some of those things are good. So iNaturalist is a great program where you get to, you know, take a photo of this bug that you don't know what it is and you upload the picture and it tells you what it is. And it's a crowdsource so people can help you figure out what it is. And sometimes it's a new record. You know, so it's a great way for people to get um, some really good natural history information very quickly. Um, Go ahead. Uh, um, well, so I think there's this dichotomy between, you know, phones being able to do everything that we forget our, forget ourselves, but it, because it can do everything, it also allows us to do the, the things. It can also enhance our ability to understand nature as well. What about creating a gamification system? So not a Pokemon Go, but a Pokemon Real, where you go around the world and take pictures and get points for finding different animals that you photograph in the wild. Is there any type of efforts like that to get kids more interested and involved in nature? Yeah, it's a it's an idea a lot of people have kind of converged on, I think. Um, Pokemon Go has been great for, for getting people out. Um, I love that. I do uh, think that people are using it now in a, a naturalist sense. iNaturalist is pretty good, actually, for it doesn't give you points, but you get some kudos for, for uh, scoring uh, you know, cool animals. And so if that counts for something, but yeah, it's not, it's not sending you into the, you know, this battle zone or whatever that Pokemon Go does, at least as far as I understand it, which is not a lot. <laughs> as long as you're not walking in front of a bus while you're trying to catch them yeah. all. Gosh, that's uh, it's interesting what people will do, but I wanted, I wanted to get into your work. You talked about uh, a grant that you'd worked on, and I know your director, you, you've been involved with, possibly are still, with the National Science Foundation. What role do governments, what role do those type of organizations play with the future of science? Sure. So, you know, in the old days, you'd have to rely on a rich donor that said, I would love you to write a book on pheasants. Here's a million dollars, go around the world and write a book about pheasants based on that. And that's a real example from William Beebe, who got to do that. Who, that was a cool thing, but that happens rarely, as you can imagine. Um, so the role of, of governments are to provide funding for researchers doing work for their own good and for the good of the whole. And so at National Science Foundation, when I was a program director, we were looking to fund the best basic science researchers in my field, which is uh, systematic. So people trying to figure out the tree of life. And, you know, what's the purpose of the tree of life isn't going to be clear from the work that they're doing, but having this great tree of understanding who's related to whom 
serves lots of purposes downstream that people can apply to understanding medicine or health and all those things. But someone has to do that basic fundamental research first. And so our governments can fund that basic science research. And the National Science Foundation has about $8 billion to give away each year, um, which isn't enough for the you know, 300,000 researchers in the country. What should but, the number be? Uh, it should be twice that. Okay. Twice that, I think, is what we figured out would fund 25% of the best research being done. The funding rate's probably less than 10% right now. And that's in the US. So Canada's gotten a lot better recently after some downtimes. Um, so politics matters. Who you vote for matters. And um, what you care about matters. Um, but sometimes it's easy to say, let's just fund the medical field and, and forget all this collecting animals crap. But the collecting animals and understanding organisms in the wild stuff leads to the applied stuff that we all need to, to better ourselves with. Well, it's also a little bit like history. History in a lot of senses, you can't see the direct value until suddenly we go through the same things we've done over and over again. It's not quite the same, but it always rhymes. And I think there's a lot of things that you can learn from this fundament, fundamental understanding. I think with the National Science Foundation, with, with large institutions like that, what are the big problems that you see? There's, um, there's a lot of oversight, which is good, um, but it's a, it's actually a really well-run institution. I really enjoyed working at National Science Foundation. Um, it's hard for an active scientist like me to kind of put my mind towards the busy work of government. And, you know, so there's a lot of like online exams that you have to take, training that you have to take, which is, you know, some function of, of working in a giant government. But, you know, so I, I would have rather skipped those and focused on the, you know, the funding good people for good science stuff. Um, but in general, it was a wonderful experience, eye-opening. I learned a lot about how, how government works and how science works from the top down. And so it was a, a wonderful experience. Um, I'd rather be doing the science though. So I only did it for a year. It was a rotation, which is a good rotation. But, and a, another great thing about that institution is that, you know, half the people working there are rotators. So there's always insight from people from the outside while they're working on the inside, which is great. It also means you don't have career politicians, which is even better. So, mm -hmm. so you're working at the, you were working there at the NSF. What's happened? Uh, what's happened since the debacle of, of the last election when it comes to the NSF, when it comes to the science community as a whole, from someone who's on the inside and I imagine has some sources? <laughs> so the, the party line is, you know, the NSF has been getting bipartisan support for 50 years plus, right? So they, no matter who's been president, um, they've been do, doing okay. Now you do have to keep your head down a little bit so it doesn't get chopped off. You know, we had to be very careful about what we said, you can't ask for your, you can't ask for funding. You just have to take what you get. You know, you can't promote yourself or the institution. Um, you can't say we need another $10 billion. It's not NASA. You know, it's not like we're taking to the moon. We need this rocket. So give us money. Um, Congress gives the money. The president proposes a budget, but Congress can lift it and they have in the past. So um, I think Congress, despite who's president, um, can see the value in the science, uh, perhaps more than a single person, even if that single person is the, the captain of the ship. That said, I imagine you're much happier to be back in, in the university in the research oh, setting I now. Love I love it. I'd rather get my hands dirty and get splashing in the mud and, and collecting fish and studying them inside and out um, is much more fun than, than pushing papers. <laughs> what, what do you get up to these days? Um, right now, we're planning a trip to Haiti. Uh, an ichthyologist, you know, collecting fishes for natural history haven't, hasn't really been to Haiti to study fresh waters in a long time. So that's the poorest country in the West, the worst water quality in the West. So um, figuring out how the water has changed there. There's lots of the biggest lakes in the Greater Antilles, the 
the arc of Caribbean islands there um, is pretty poorly known, um, pretty understudied. So I can't wait to go there and, and see what the little fishes that were last studied a long time ago, how they're doing and if they're still there. Speaking of last studied a long time ago, you'll, you'll know the name. I can't quite remember the name. I was listening to, I think it was Discovery or BBC. They were talking about a fish that was discovered that was 70 million from 70 million years ago that we didn't even realize still existed. Yeah, you know? that's the can't. Uh, that's on my business card. I have one of those laying around here somewhere. I love that thing. It's amazing. It, that fish, the coelacanth, is more closely related to you than you or it is to a salmon or to a bass or to a tuna. And that's because it's part of the lineage that gave rise to the things that came onto land first. So the first fishes that came onto land um, are part of this group that includes us, right? That lineage gave rise to all land vertebrates. And a close relative of those was coelacanths. And they do a doggy paddle when they swim. It's crazy. They have these arms. And you can look at x-rays of their fins, and they have, you know, bones very much like ours. So uh, it's a strange animal. And so what happened was the lineage was thought to have gone extinct 65 million years ago with a bunch of other things flying around. Uh, but they were thought to have gone extinct, and then they found uh, a a researcher named Courtney Latimer, who was starting a small little museum in South Africa, went on a fishing boat and they had this weird fish that she didn't know what it was. Um, and she contacted some other researchers and it turned out to be a coelacanth and people were amazed that they were still around. So and, there's been it's about 70 million years. Yeah. Just to, just to put that in context, how little do we understand about the ocean right now? We know more about space. Um, it's incredible. So the oceans are not completely unexplored, but we're finding not just new species, we find new habitats. You know, we find cold seeps and hot seeps, and uh, there's so much out there. The Ross Ice Sea Shelf, which you can never say, this expanding area underneath the Antarctic, is, you know, opening up new habitats, and, and we're actually studying that too, the fauna that's there that's never been seen before. It's still under the ice, but it's uh, opening up with warming and expanding. You know, that's just one example, but all around the world, you know, the oceans are so enormous. Most of the, our blue planet, obviously. What yeah. percentage would you say is explored thus far? Just a guess, obviously. Yeah, probably less than 10%, I'd say. Because we, we know mostly about the surface area. And even that is, you know, what we know about it is, is limited. And once you get, you know, 10 meters below the surface, you're, you're in no man's land. What happens at night, you know, when the deep sea rises up at night? So the largest migration on the planet Earth is happening every day as, as deep sea animals kind of migrate uh, towards the surface and then drop back down uh, as day approaches. So it's, a, it's this amazing... Thing that's going on out there that we know very little about. Why is it happening? They're migrating up to feed and to be more active under under the cover of darkness, and then uh, drop back down. So these deep sea organisms that rely on bioluminescence and other things are moving up to more friendly habitats for food and capturing things. So, and when you say biggest migration, do we have any idea if you were to have scales of the amount of animal, plant, etc., life? on the surface versus in the water, how they would stack up? There's way more stuff in the deep sea. The, the, the most like voluminous organisms, vertebrate organisms are in the deep sea. Um, so I guess biomass would be hard to, to compare, you know, if you're picking up, I, I forgot, I, I don't remember the numbers now, but there's just a tremendous amount of life down there. Um, much of it still unknown. And so, you know, there's not going to be a mega mouth. Sorry to disappoint everybody, but there will be lots of small critters and sometimes big critters that we just uh, don't know much about. But there's a tremendous amount of biomass and, and people are trying to exploit that before we even discover it. So there are permits for people to collect 
fishes and invertebrates from the deep sea, you know, below a thousand meters, which was before really just for research purposes. But now people want to do it for getting cheap sources of protein to make cat food and dog food and, and fertilizer, which is a shame because we're exploiting this last of the world's greatest natural resources available, unexplored natural resources anyway. And realistically, if we're going to do it, it's probably really healthy. It would probably be at least better to give feed us to humans, to, regardless of the the terrible yeah. ethical problems. Yeah, they just want cheap protein. And mm -hmm. there's a lot of protein in the deep sea, sadly. Interesting. So a kilometer down, a thousand leagues under the sea. That, that's a thousand leagues, right? Or is that 10 kilometers? No, a, league, a league's about two <laughs> miles. So the, a league is not a good, you know, don't believe Jules Verne. The ocean's not that deep. <laughs> that bastard. So we don't. Well, have... I guess that was, which, the two thousand leagues under the sea is a vertical distance, uh, not a or a horizontal distance, if I remember right. It's something complicated. The, yeah, the greatest, the depth, the ocean's not even as deep as most people think. So the deepest parts of the ocean, you know, it's easier for me to do it in miles. Sorry, is a you know seven about seven miles deep, and the average depth is about two miles. So it's not as deep as ever. I mean, that's tremendously deep if you compare it to like the tall building, but it's uh, not as deep as most people would guess. So something something like 10, 11 kilometers. That's that's roughly Everest, isn't it? Yeah. Well, no. Um, no. Everest, Everest isn't nine. But on, on similar <laughs> orders of magnitude. That's okay. We're, we're not going to get it here perfectly. So there's, there's so much that's unexplored. What are the what are the potential findings that we have? Why why is it worth doing? Hmm. Well, for me, it's worth doing um, exploration for exploration's sake. You don't know is the beauty of it, so you don't know what you'll find, and that's what I like about it. You know, you can go somewhere, and I always find something new. It's weird. <laughs> There's never a uh, you know an expedition where I'm like, we're going to find this, this, and this, and we'll be done. You know, there's always something new that we find, and there's often things that we don't find that are surprising as well. But the things that we find that are new, and not necessarily new species, but it could be a new behavior that's not been observed before, or, or something that's, you know, in a different part of its range than you thought possible, things like that. But I love exploration for like, exploration's sake. So just seeing, you know, what's down there finding out what new species there are, what new habitats there are, how, how these species live. We know very little about the behavior of these organisms. And so finding out uh, some of that is, is starting to happen, but slowly. So even you know, how some of these fishes swim or you know, what a Dumbo octopus do does for lunch, you know, we don't know these things yet. Okay, so I gotta ask this one now. And this isn't to be nitpicky. This is very much because I'm curious. Is it fishes or fish when you're referring to multiple fish? So in the scientific sense or in a, uh, when we're talking generally about fishes in their entirety, uh, it should be fishes whenever you're using the plural when you're discussing more than one species. So more than one type of fish, you should say species. So if you have a goldfish and a zebra, fish you have two fishes but if you have lots of goldfish you just have a lot of fish so you can be both plural but in terms of one type it's fish and if it's mul more than one type of fish you're talking about fishes says the guy here that wanted to get rid of the English class. Apparently that's not a good idea, guys. So so what's the most transformational experience you've had, the most inspiring, interesting story or or trip that you've gone on? Mm. Uh, I always go to my my thoughts always lead to Madagascar for that question. So uh, we went with my mentor John Sparks, who was a curator of fishes at the American Museum of Natural History. Just as I, after I was hired here at LSU, actually, so my last trip uh, as a New Yorker, um, we went to Madagascar to go after some cave fishes, and our very first field site was this sunken lake, uh, a, a sinkhole that you know, thirty feet between the the rim where we were standing and and the drop, and we had to climb over the ledge and drop down into the water. I was the first in because I was trying to be brave, even though I was really scared. <laughs> and I swam around for a bit, didn't see anything, climbed back up. 
uh, John Sparks and some of our other colleagues went down there and John caught these two little black, you know, very dark, eyeless, functionally cave fish, but we weren't in a cave, there was sunlight. So as soon as I saw those, I knew he had collected some new species. Uh, and it's not often, and I've collected, you know, I've described 13 or so new species. And it was the first time I was like, this is definitely new. Nobody knows about this. And that was super exciting. Uh, not as exciting was um, John and others starting to fall ill afterwards. So we call it sinkhole fever. So it was kind of a, it was kind of funny at first, then it really wasn't funny at all. And I'll leave that story for John. And then um, now it's funny again. So we named the species Marari Bay, which means big sickness in Malagasy. So how does that yeah, name, how's the naming process work? <laughs> um, Do you just get first first finder, first first namer? Yeah, exactly. The person describing it's to name it what they like, and you know, just gotta Latinize it. And so you can take a Malagasy name like like we did and Latinize it. Interesting. So like if Trump decided to crossbreed a tiger with something else, he could have a Trumpian tiger as, as long as it's a new species. You get to you get to have the ego as big as you want if you if you Yeah, can. although we can't you can't make a new species and then name it. Oh, okay. Well, how will the process work for that? Let's talk about that. So so it should be a natural This is actually an interesting place that you're taking me right now because I've been thinking about this a lot. So, um we name species that are in nature. But you know you can name, you know, ch the chicken or cow or or pig, the domesticated versions. So you can name those. But we are getting to a point where we can use these gene editing tools to vastly transform the natural world. And there's no doubt in my mind that Jurassic Park and and you know other things like that will be the norm. As you know, not only are we CRISPRing, CRISPR is the tool. The gene editing tool, and so I, I jokingly call it CRISPRing. But um, as we transform the natural world and ourselves, right? So just last week, we have a, a, a Chinese scientist editing the genes of of humans, you know, which is crazy already. Before we really know the power of these tools, it's it's an interesting future. Are you optimistic? pessimistic or how do you feel about that future and what happens and then the possible timelines i am a anybody who knows me knows i'm a um you know a big optimist for everything i'm happy about everything i'm very pessimistic about the use of crispr in the future for life on earth and i'm sad to say that but i think what's going to happen is we're going to start fooling around with uh, these tools, which an undergrad in my lab can use. You know, it's so powerful and so easy. And we're going to start changing how the planet looks and what's out there. And the timeline is, you know, in 10 years, I think they're going to be genetically modified pets and they will be designer babies. And they will be all that that we fear just because we don't have the the moral um, abilities to to hold back. I think we're we're so enamored with technology that we we forget. I mean, it's it's a it's a Jurassic Park line. Don't make me say it. <laughs> but so anybody can look up the Jeff Goldblum quotes and and know. But it's true. You know, we you know should we do it? Is somebody asking that? Um, and even if they're asking it, is anybody listening? Yeah, it's it's one of those things. You say ten years, and yet we have genetically engineered. I, I believe it was baby twins, and that was a couple of days a couple of days ago. It's just it's happening at such an accelerated rate. It's happening at a rate that evolution never oh, never yeah. foresee, foresaw. So that we're also not in any way, shape, or form equipped to handle a responsibility like that. Yeah, I mean, in ten years, I think it'll be pervasive, and we'll have to get used to it. I mean, the problem is, what if it's a, you know, if a bio terrorist starts thinking about this stuff? If you make a mosquito that bites more than one time, you can give everybody, you know, bloodborne diseases. Right now, mosquitoes take a blood meal and lay eggs. What if they go person to person biting, you know, think of all the diseases that can be spread. Or what if they make, a, you know, all the cattle 
die off. And I mean, that that's a little bit more advanced for organisms that have a longer generation time. But we're using CRISPR to eliminate mosquitoes on certain Caribbean islands now because of Zika. You know, you can produce all all males and you can, uh, but we can, we can do a lot now. And as the technology improves, it's just going to be incredible. So it's such a powerful tool. I hope we have the judgment to, to use it um, uh, appropriately. Well, the scary thing is I feel like it's a lot like cybersecurity. It's much easier to play offense than it is to play defense. And you never know what's going to happen until it happens. The NSA makes ransomware and suddenly it's all over everything. And of course, they're not going to claim that they made it. But everyone knows that the, the huge ransomware attacks we had over a few years back were NSA designed programs to make you not have your access to your computer. It's almost impossible to stop this stuff. And genetics is just another level up, I imagine, in my mind. Yeah, I mean, we could use it for good, right? We can eliminate. We will. We will definitely do that, too. But um, yeah. Are you more worried about uses for bad or accidental um, accidents? I think people will do it on purpose, just like um, this Chinese scientist who probably had good intentions. Um, but, you know, it's just a shame that it's being done without kind of the, the moral support or moral interests of, um, you know, that's why we need philosophers, right? We need people to think about this stuff before we start doing it. I would agree, but I would argue it's probably impossible because I know you said you have twins. When you find out that your twins suddenly have this disease and there's someone in the black market alley in China that can solve it for you, you're willing to do absolutely anything, break any law necessary to do it. And that's human nature. Yeah, no, it makes sense uh, in that way, yeah. Um, How do we prevent it from going out of control? I don't know. I don't know. I mean, I, I think it's too late. <laughs> you think it's too late. Is this, is this extinction level possibility in your mind? Um, not for humans. We'll be around messing stuff up as, as long as we can. Oh man. I feel like such a, I sound like a pessimist and I'm not usually on that way. I guess I'm just worried, you know, I'm worried um, about what, uh, how I don't think we've had a tool this powerful that we knew so little about what we could do with it um, and how easily it can get into the wrong hands. I would definitely agree with that. The only other p- possibility would be an artificial general intelligence, which we don't have and is much harder to do, at least at this point. Yeah, I, I don't see like a snap of the finger, like uh, you know, a computer figuring out it's alive kind of thing ever happening. I, I think we can, we can get very close to mimicking uh, life or, you know, it's not life, but um, awareness in a machine. But I, I just don't see the Terminator future that some people hope for. <laughs> what about a Planet of the Apes scenario where we bring other creatures up to our intelligence or up to higher intelligence levels? Do you think that's possible based off your understanding? Hmm. I don't know, to be honest, that I don't know about that one. That would be, it'd be difficult, but I don't, I, I, that's not what I worry about. I worry about uh, messing with ourselves. So, so what happens when we bring back Neanderthals, which we can do, right? We can make a Neanderthal baby. How are we going to treat our closest relative that ever lived on earth? Will we let it use our bathroom? You know, like what we're pretty bad. You know, it's like, how do we treat, do we put in a zoo? Something that has 99% similarity with us. I mean, chimpanzees are pretty close, 1% difference between us and chimps. And you bring something that's even closer, you know, another species of human on earth. If we do that, what are we going to, how do we treat the rest of life? If we start filling in the gaps between us and what people think are the other animals. The Is dog- it- <laughs> Speaking of other animals, we've got some friendly here. Isn't the 1% stat a little bit misleading, though? My understanding is that there's a 1% difference in the total listing of the genomes, but that would be like if you write a book and I write a book and I have one chapter in there seven times and you only have it in there once and in a different spot. Uh, it's a little bit. I mean, the genes can be vastly different. 
But I mean, you don't have to worry about the DNA just to look at a, a chimp and see the similarities. But if you put a Neanderthal, uh, I mean, that's a different member of the same genus that we belong to. And they're not even, they might even be closer humans than that, that, you know, we're still discovering. So there was a time when there were five human species walking the earth. We're the only one that are around today. But it, it's going to, you know, melt some brains when we, when somebody brings back the Neanderthal for which we have the genome for. Um, and in all likelihood, we probably were the ones that wiped them out of existence while also breeding with them. Quite possible. Yeah. I mean, most people from, of European descent have 2% or so Neanderthal in them. Thank God it came out that it was European and not African or something else that would have led to just racist mobs exploding over evidence of all kinds of ness. How do you think about evolution? I know you said you've got twins and you wanted to, you thought that was a good or interesting topic, something worth talking about. Well, it's, um, it's inter I think every evolutionary biologist should have identical twins because, uh, the nature nurture stuff that goes on in my house, you know, that my wife lets me get away with. No, just kidding. I always joke. Like I only hug one of them. <laughs> <laughs> only send one to school, you know, just, just testing you know, I'm I'm joking. They're both lovely and awesome. And, and, we do let them have different experiences, which is, I think, uh, good. But I do think about how different they have the same genome. So they have identical genomes. Their DNA is the same, but they're different and they look slightly different. They look more than slightly different, but they're, um, I noticed I could tell them apart by personality quicker than I can by visual appearance sometimes. So, you know, what makes Anjali laugh the way she does and what makes Chaya interested in pleasing adults more than her sister? Like what are the little things that are environmentally based or, you know, the methylation patterns that changed how their DNA is being expressed from each other? I love that stuff. It's just fascinating. I'm glad you brought that up. I feel like the nature and nurture debate is kind of it's kind of moot. In my opinion, it's, it, and from what I've seen of the science, it's much more of a nature plus nurture. So you have your, you have your basic genome, but then the epigenetics, what's getting turned on and off, like you said, is more or less what's impacting the vast majority of the, of those differences. So it might not be as interesting to hug one and not the other, but maybe, maybe you feed one of them a high sugar diet and one of them a high mm -hmm. fat diet and one of them gets to exercise and one of them has to sit all day and you see the differences. Oh yeah, I mean the those twins growing up and you know separated at birth or you know and reunited and they you know they have you know the same hobbies and the same quirks despite growing up in different places. So is it genetic to you know put rubber bands on your wrists like the gym twin the famous gym twins who were separated or is it naming you know they name their dog the same thing even though they live so far you know it's just weird you know, what is controlled? What is, you know, free will? <laughs> do you think we have free will? Do you think, do you think our genes, our, our environment, how, what percentage do you think is predetermined versus conscious? Hmm. Not to put you on the spot or anything. Yeah, I have no idea. <laughs> I have no idea. I think there's a lot of free will. I, I do think there's free will. I, I think, um, I don't think we're machines, you know, we, we do dumb things, we do smart things, we do brave things. And so there's certainly free will, I, I, I imagine. I, I wish I knew the arguments for not thinking there is better, but I don't. The best argument would be more or less if you had someone else with the same genetic makeup as you that had gone through the same life as you, they would make that same decision as you essentially every single time. And it feels like free will. It's kind of like when I reached for the glass because I realized I was thirsty, but I didn't realize I was thirsty until I started to reach for the glass. It's the mm. subconscious conscious. Do you think, do you think there's a cutoff line for free will? Do you think all animals have free will are some animals machines? How do you think about that? It's an interesting, I, I mean, I, I think all life has free will, the bacterium, you know, moving about, uh, in search of food, the direction it goes um, is free will. And, and, and maybe I have an expanded definition of that. But an organism that decides to stay on the ice rather than dive into the ocean, you know, the, 
the penguin that walks away from the crowd. There's, I, I don't think animals work mechanically. I think you can break down a lot of what they do in a mechanical, uh, probabilistic inner box type way, but, um, there's room for error around it. And that variation exists in every organism. So that variation is what evolutionary biologists study. Why is this penguin have bluer feathers? Why is this penguin, um, swim less than the others. There's variation in all of the, not just the DNA, but the behaviors and morphologies of all life on earth and, and figuring out which ones survive and last and which ones don't is, is evolutionary biology. Do you lend any credence to the, the aesthetic evolution theory? I've seen floated around a bit in certain species where, where and I believe it was where the males don't have penises and can't rape the females, that there's a lot more that goes into the actual decision process for which essentially where females have more power, where the decision process for which male to mate with. So if you look at certain birds, et cetera, the ones that don't have extra gear are the ones that are the more attractive. And you see small changes happen between different species that don't seem to have any evolutionary advantage. Well, so, I'll give you the example of ducks. You know, there's a lot of antagonistic ducks are the ones with most birds don't have genitalia, but ducks are, are, uh, almost silly, silly in their enormous elongated corkscrewed gonads. <laughs> They're junk. And I always tell my students, isn't it good? They don't fly around like that. Cause when it's out, <laughs> when it's X, uh, when it's out there, and they're fighting each other, drowning females. They're incredibly aggressive. So females have developed, uh, you know, corkscrew vaginas that go in the opposite direction as the males. You know, so there's this incredible give and take in animal world where there's uh, what you're explaining in terms of uh, mating behavior. But they're beautiful, you know ducks as we saw in you know people falling in love with the mandarin duck in central park you know so there's a i don't so were you saying i i'm not sure if i'm as familiar with your so so the th the theory is that there's some combination of evolutionary advantage i.e survival means but then there were in in species where females had more of a choice for who to breed with they mm -hmm. would choose the ones that if all other things being equal were more attractive, stood out more. So it's yeah. kind of it's kind of like if you look at the different, if you look at different, and, th and this was primarily related to birds. That's where a lot of the examples came from. But if you look at different types of birds, you could see two different, separate species of bird that looked n essentially identical. One would finish their mating pattern looking up, and one would finish that weird little dance thing they did looking down. Nothing else was different, and yet this difference had led to a change in the species of these two these two birds does that make sense essentially yeah. the preference for the females yeah the preference the interesting part is the idea is that the preference is inherent but it's also heritable so the preference is passed down with the trait to look up or to look down and so there's this isolation reproductive isolation that happens uh, which is pretty cool and um you know the sexy sons have you know I like how he'll look and our kids will look good because of that, you know, and, and they'll have good kids. And so there's so much control, uh, apparently, you know, from the genes leading the, the organisms to make more genes that are similar or the same. So the selfish gene idea is really one of the most interesting, you know, that's really transformed how people think about evolutionary biology and how much control there is of outside of of our brains you know why we do things the way we do and how organisms do them and outside of just a simple natural selection view of the world well it's part of it right it's not but who wh where is selection happening at the organismal level at the genetic level somewhere in between it's probably both and it depends on the case but the nuances of that is something darwin didn't have an opportunity to study but you know as we now have all these tools in front of us, we can really get into it. Thinking about how genes jump uh, within a genome and across genomes and, and more. 
I've heard some compelling, some compelling thoughts that a lot of DNA was passed when we were early on in, I believe, the bacteria phase of of humanity and life, so to speak. So that a lot of genes were essentially freely passed between different between different bacteria, and then that it possibly explains a lot of the seemingly quick evolutionary adaptations that we see in certain creatures. Is that it's kind of already present? Yeah, there was a lot of what's called horizontal gene transfer in early life on Earth. And so that muddies the root of the tree of life because of that. Um, it's still happening, right? There's still genes being transferred from one organism to another. There's viruses that facilitate that and other mechanisms. But it, it complicates how we see what we think is a branching tree of life that sometimes has these vines that realign who's a who should actually be more closely related to whom based on these transfer events that have happened where do you see us going from here do you see multiple species of human in the next 10 20 years how long until we have that well I, you know we're weird because we we're not having a natural selection we're not our our weakest fit poor, poorest fit organ individuals don't die off you know stephen hawking's uh, would have been dead and, and unable to be uh, unable to communicate in almost any other time period. But we keep them around, right? And he's had babies and he's produced the next generation, something he wouldn't have been able to do if he was a wild animal. So I don't see us speciating unless we bring back Homo naledi and, and Homo neanderthalus and all these other species that did exist with us at the same time. Uh, so I don't, I don't see Homo sapiens becoming two or more different species Just ever. Just like CRISPR? Hmm. Yeah, I guess if we manipulate ourselves into this cyber, cyborg era, um, which I, I, I do, you know, give me a bionic leg and, and give me a microchip that teaches me French and the, uh, you know, but what are we different species then? I'm, I'm not so sure. I'm not so sure. See, but if that's okay, why not give me a 5% more effective brain and a 4% uh, more effective metabolism or whatever it is? What's the difference between the mechanical and the, the genetic changes? Because I think the genetic changes are inevitable. I think so too. Um, and we'll definitely speed it up with CRISPR. Maybe it's uh, my organismal centric view and not the human centric. So I think we can do whatever we want to ourselves. That doesn't harm others, but we have to do it um, at least with an adult saying they want that stuff, but designer babies, I, I don't think we should do moralistically. I, I think people with Down syndrome are awesome. You know, I don't think we should eliminate what people don't um, see as, as being part of the future uh, of humanity that we can eliminate all diseases. I, I think people with on the autism spectrum can, we, it's better if we start adapting and finding ways to allow them to live their best lives rather than eliminating, you know, whole groups of people from our population. But let's play devil's advocate. Let's say one of your daughters was going to to be completely fine and the other one was going to be let oh we'll, we'll make it a, a real hypothetical an identical twin but with down syndrome or something similar would you not feel compelled to help her not have that if it was possible see it's a hard question yeah it is a hard question so my wife and i are going to foster and adopt and we've talked about you know there are kids with down syndrome out there um if we can give the opportunity for somebody out there with Down syndrome to have a, a happy and healthy life, we will. Um, That's a different question, though, because it's, it's kind of it's kind of robbing the opportunity that your one daughter might have had. Yeah, and I think I, that that's the moral imperative, almost. Yeah, it's a tough one. To be honest, I I, I think uh, if we had had. Um, if we knew we were having a child with a, uh, a disease, and let's stick with Down syndrome, we, we would have had that baby um, just because we would have prepared and, and thought about that. 
if we could have fixed it, or maybe not, I shouldn't say fixed it, but if we could have changed it, um, I don't know. I don't know. See, I think that's a Freudian slip that all of us would make, though, is we do we do kind of think about it that way. So I, I know this is controversial topics for people to talk about and discuss because it's uncomfortable. But I think it's important considering where we're headed. I know personally, if I found out that our baby was going to have some type of issues, I would want to try to correct those issues that even even from a relationship status, the divorce rates go up from 50 percent to 90 percent if you have a child with special needs and it's horrible, but it also is in some ways, at least a statistical fact of life that it will yeah. probably make their lives harder. It's hard. Yeah. I'm not yeah. saying abortion, but I'm saying if you can enhance, it almost feels like a, an obligation. And that, that makes me think that humanity will move in that direction. Yeah, may, maybe you're right. I'm, I'm listening to uh, Carl Zimmer's new book. Uh, she has her mother's laugh and he's starting to get into that now as he, as he, considered the possible diseases that his daughter would have had or could have had before she was born. It's definitely a very difficult topic. And I, I understand why someone would want to fix that with gen, you know, gene, gene, uh, modification. Yeah. It's a, it's a hard question. I'm actually looking at this guys in a, I'm looking at potentially putting out a science fiction book on a similar topic to this. If you guys go to disruptors.fm slash free at your email, and then I can send you the first few chapters once, once that's ready. But well, I think it's, a, yeah, I think it's super interesting. It is. Yeah. I think, sci I think sci-fi is very important because how else can you envision a future? And if it goes horribly wrong, how else can you try to prevent it from happening? Yeah. And will we learn any lessons from that? So yeah, good, good on you for, for exploring that topic. What's been the most inspirational thing for you? What, what have you learned the most from? Has it been sci-fi? Has it been a professor? What was it? Hmm. I've learned a lot and been inspired by the people I've met abroad. So I've, I've been very lucky to, you know, I have this weird job where I get to collect fish around the world. <laughs> and, I, and, I, and I meet a lot of fishermen. And they know a lot about the animals that they collect, you know, that they're eating. That I might be studying, um, you know, the Malagasy who didn't go into the cave because they, you know, they they knew somehow that it might be dangerous. You know, the water might be dangerous, or that you know the Sri Lankan fishermen who knew more about these species that I was describing to the scientific world in a scientific way, but they already had names for. It. You know, the subtle differences that they saw that even I didn't see. They helped me discover a new species by their descriptions of the different fish. So I'm I'm just amazed at, at the at the way that people living on two dollars a day or that might not ever have a you know the opportunity to have a college education, how much those people know about the natural world and how quickly we can forget about it. So um, that's what inspires me is the the people who I see in living among and within nature in a, in a way that we forget about in the West sometimes. Oh, they know so much more about nature. I would say if you're able to take someone like that and then help them with a, with a, a more of a conventional education to supplement that, they would make the best researchers because we're disconnected. At the, I mean, we're, we're connected to each other and say via Skype or Google Hangouts, but we're severely disconnected from the world. Yeah, I, I always try to recruit um, from those places. I have a it's not the same thing, but a, a lot of my work is in Latin America, and so the, the opportunities are limited there. So trying to get, you know, a student from Cuba or Guatemala or a place where there are scientists, there are many great scientists, but having them uh, get a PhD from a U.S. institution can really help them when they go back home as well. There's just more opportunities here, and, and having. Uh, the ability to give them that opportunity is, is something I'm, I'm really proud of. So, And let's face it, they're probably much scrappier and willing to work harder. What, uh, what technology or, or area are you most excited about? We've had a little bit of pessimism. Let's get to some optimism. Yeah. Well, the genomic stuff, uh, you know, it's funny. It's, it's both the pessimistic part, but the optimistic part, our abilities to understand how the tree of life has, has changed over time. 
is just growing every day. I mean, the, we're looking at big parts of the genome now, which we never thought we'd be able to do before to study the tree of life. And now we can look at whole genomes and how we figure out how that works. Because there's a lot of figuring out how the, what models will allow us to understand those relationships. We actually have to model stuff and, and figuring out that is a new puzzle that grad students today are, are figuring out in a way that is making them more mathematical, which is making them think in a new way because we have more data than we know what to do with now. And figuring out how to use those data and, and figuring out why the data look different for different questions and why they give us different answers and getting the right answer is is complicated and, and they're uh, so I'm, I'm really optimistic about how the next generation of scientists are are multidisciplinary so a natural history person who's collecting fishes in the wild is also doing lots of heavy-duty math on the computer to figure out um, how to better understand the natural world so it's 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 pretty that's pretty exciting to me it's a super it's a super interesting world and technology is that proverbial double-edged sword. Yeah. We can, we can use it for good, we can use it for evil, or we can accidentally cut ourselves with it. But that we're probably going to play with the sword, let's face it. Sure. If you wanted to leave people with something, a quote, a call to action, it can be anything, before you, tell, they, before you tell them where to find you and all the good stuff, what would it be and why? Yeah, it would be to travel for sure. I mean, I think we tend to think we understand the world by watching TV or looking it up on the internet, but there's nothing like having the experiences of, of traveling to a new place to realize how big the world is and how different we are uh, at the same time being very similar, you know? So, you know, don't go to a resort, get out into the forest if you can, you know, lo meet local people living local lives and see how similar and different we are at the same time. It'll, it'll give you a better appreciation of the earth. And uh, so that's my call to action for the, whoever's listening. Of earth and humanity. So we don't keep <laughs> deciding that we want to build walls and put up borders between each other. Because I think yeah. we've, we've realized just from this conversation, at least, we're all pretty darn closely related. We're all essentially relatives. And we may just have that one big uh, family reunion one day. And uh, yeah. it's it's worth keeping that in mind. I think I think the travel advice is super valuable for people. Live in the moment, see the world, love what you do. Prozenta, this has been this has been a lot of fun. I honestly would like to keep doing this for quite a while, but I I have to I have to get running. Where's the best place for people to find you, learn about more about what you do, and then Twitter all the good stuff? Yeah, I always tell people like if you can figure out how to spell my name, I'm pretty easy to find because <laughs> there's not too many of me with that spelling out there. So if you Put in P-R-O-S-A-N-T-A -S in your favorite browser. My Twitter will come up and other stuff will come up to find me. But I'm, I'm pretty Twitter friendly. So uh, if you look up pro, spelled the Cajun way, P-R-E-A-U-X underscore fish, you'll find me on Twitter. And it's a good place to have a conversation with me. Yeah, and I'm sure you got plenty of professional Santa jokes, so we won't make one of those here. We'll have links and everything in the show notes, guys. Don't worry. It's hard to spell. It's hard to say, but he's a, he's a pretty awesome guy, and there's a tiger in the background, so I'm going to let you run from that. Thanks for coming today, man. Thanks for asking me some interesting questions. Got me thinking. Yeah, that's the, that's the idea. Get smart people thinking, and then they get other people thinking. See you, guys. Cheers. Bye.